Hi everyone and welcome to Tap Into Your Creativity. Today we have Gordon Stoddard um, joining us um, all the way from Sausalito, California and I'm going um, I see you Gordon and I'm excited. Oh, there you are. Oh, that I was so nervous about that. <laughs> oh, you did it. <laughs> you did the, the hardest part. And right. um, I can't thank you enough for joining me today, um, Gordon. I'm super excited that you are here and tap into your creativity. And now you're part of this army of artists. And um, I, I seriously can't thank you enough. And welcome to the program. Thank you. Happy to be here. And I'm happy to support your cause. It's awesome. I'm so glad, Gordon. So um, I just want to make a, a little parenthesis. Um, people had asked me how I'm feeling. I'm doing much better. <laughs> I had COVID. Um, today is my day that I'm actually going to be out of isolation. So I'm super excited about that. Um, it's been a rough week, but we're on the other side. Thank God. <laughs> so you made it. <laughs> I made it. Exactly. Exactly. So Gordon, um, tell us a little bit about yourself um, from the very beginning for people that don't know you at all and, and um, want to know who you are and um, tell us your childhood. Where are you from? Um, okay. Tell us a little bit about everything, I guess. It's so interesting driving here. You know, you start to play it out in your head and you start thinking about, okay, and what you know because i knew that you asked those kind of questions and and so it's kind of nice to go back and think about the influences and sort of like where i am now and sort of how things unfolded um my i was born in california but my father was an acad he was an architect and then got into academia and we moved to the east coast so i was always living in college towns so that's sort of my upbringing which was maybe different than other kids because that was the norm, you know, beautiful campuses and, you know, uh, college environments. Um, Where were you? Mother, what's that? Where were you? We went to New York first. Then my dad taught at Brown. So we went to Providence. Wow. Then we went to Concord. And then finally he, he settled in uh, where Penn State is. So State College, Pennsylvania. Um, so, but when we first moved to New York as a very small child, my mother was really interested in art. And she would take me, as my dad was trying to build this career, we, you know, we didn't really see him. My mom would take me to the museums, like all the museums, and as a little tiny kid, and buy me like coloring books of Degas and Picasso. <laughs> you know, it was very, <laughs> so it just seemed normal to sort of have that kind of influence. Um, but definitely my mother sort of, and then my dad, you know, being an architect. Um, so that sort of got some of the, you know, very young. And I did as a, like in second grade, I, I was really not very good at school. I mean, they hadn't really <laughs> defined what ADD was and stuff like that. And so dyslexia, I couldn't read really. It was really hard. So, but I did a book, I wrote a book and I illustrated it. And it won all these awards like in second grade. And so that was the first sort of reinforcement for art. Because wow. the first thing, you know, as a little kid, you're, you maybe don't get those kinds of reinforcements. But so uh, then I guess going into to high school and stuff, I, I did the whole sports thing. So then suddenly my identity switched to being an athlete, like track, football, basketball, every season, you know, tennis. And that was my identity. Went to Penn State, and I was hoping to play football and not really thinking about art at all. I never took an art class or anything, but I still had those influences when I was young from the museums and stuff. And uh, luckily, football didn't work out. And so I had to bring my grades up. And I thought, <laughs> well, art's easy, right? I'll take an art class. That's, I'll get an A, maybe, or bring my grades up. And my teacher became my biggest fan and really talked me into becoming an art major. And so wow. that's kind of how it started. And, uh, and then did being you naive. Did you with, listen to your teacher then? I did. I went right into art. Yeah, I did it. I became an wow. art major. And then you, I felt like I was not as advanced as a lot of the other artists because they had been artists that had taken classes when they were young 
They seemed way more technically talented than I was. So I was always feeling like it wasn't easy. And you know, they had the kind of critiques where you had to get into the program. So there was the stress of presenting your portfolio and then get into the you know, MFA program, or not the MFA, but the BFA program. So I got in though. So that really kind of made me feel like, okay, I'm, here I am. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, that's so funny because um, I can relate. My dad is an architect oh, wow, and still that. now, he oh, wow. drafts everywhere, like on a piece of napkin or wherever he is, he's drafting. drafting. And so right. it's, yeah. it's in my mind, you know, um, my childhood, it sounds very familiar having a, a father as an architect. Yeah, I think that, that, and then my mother is an artist, so those two things were good. Actually, my father then got involved with B.F. Skinner and psychology, and he de helped develop the whole discipline of environmental behavior how oh. structures, living in structures affect your behavior and how to plan communities affect behavior. So there's a behavioral aspect, I think now that actually is in my work now, there's a psychology aspect of self discovery that's expressed through. I would just thought of that, I don't know, but. <laughs> well, that sounds very profound. I think that when you come back and listen to yourself talking about this, right. it might, it might, I might cringe, yeah, yeah, no, no, I think it's going to be a good thing for you, actually. Yeah, I mean, I'm, um, you know, that's what I was saying. Driving here, you have certain kind of realizations like, oh, that's, you know, how you get led to things. And I'm really learning that now is like, you don't, you can't control things. <laughs> exactly. And exactly. That's but so it's how you learn them. <laughs> and, and art is the perfect teacher for that. Because you really start when you become the conduit that lets it flow through you without control and trying to control things is when really great things happen. And that conduit aspect, actually, you're not just being the conduit of art, it brings everything in. So your life gets more open and but this is something I'm discovering older, as my ego has diminished. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you were a really, so you went into your art school, right? And, and I think that's why I like asking all these questions because right. I think that your past informs who you are now. And, you know, you sometimes forget to go there. So I, that's why I like to revisit. to revisit this, you know, because yeah. I think it's important to know how, who you are and who you are now because of your past. And I think you kind of have to answer those questions when you really start painting full time you need to ask those questions. Um, yeah, I, I agree. So you went to college. So I, go to, I, so I get a BFA and then I'm so naive. I'm going, I go to Philadelphia with like charcoal drawings under my arm to galleries and they're just like, hey kid, what are you doing? <laughs> so I don't know what to do. So I go to DC, I start bartending. Then I go to night classes and start learning how to do like drafting for advertising and stuff. This was pre-computer. And I got a job with a small advertising firm and I would do illustrations for them. And then my art director there thought I, she just loved my work. And she got a big job in California with the Oakland Tribune and then the San Francisco Examiner. And she brought me with her as an illustrator. So I worked for the newspapers being an illustrator. But I gotta tell you that transition from bartender <laughs> to getting that break was rather stressful because I was feeling like I wasn't going to get to where I needed to be. And then I moved into commercial art, really, because I'm an illustrator. And I thought I had kind of made it and I became very successful. I left the newspaper and I was one of the first of a group of artists that was using the computer for the very first time because that's how old I am. And because... <laughs> uh, <laughs> And so we were like, we were beta testers for Adobe and stuff. And I mean, it was, I look back at the work. Wow, it was, work, really? it was really not very good because, but also the technology wasn't that great, but it also led to abstraction because it seemed to lend itself to abstracting figures and shapes and things. Um, and so then I had a really pretty good career as a, a freelance illustrator for about 20 years. And uh, wow. then, so that's kind of, 
I thought I had made it as an artist and I started to realize I was restless. Like even telling the story, like I had, I had kind of abandoned the fine art and I thought I was an artist, but I realized I was living kind of a shadow career mm -hmm. of what I really wanted. And so it's not until the last five years that I now am doing what I'm finally meant to do. Like feel what happened, what happened at that mark? Take us to five years ago. What made you decide, okay, the, the, the illustration market, because publications had died, they had died probably seven years before that, but I was stubborn and tried to stay because it had been so good to me and I, and just started losing work, you know, and then the economy and prices going up in the Bay Area, suddenly I was in financial trouble. And, uh, and you know, a, a lot of times crisis, like severe crisis, leads to some of your most inspirational moves in your life. Um, from bartender to finally doing that, very desperate. From this, my economy going down and me really being in financial trouble, I figured if I'm gonna do anything, because I'm gonna have to work my ass off, whether I become a designer or web guy or keep doing, so I might as well pick something I really wanna do. Because I'm gonna have to work really hard anyhow. And so I just go, I'm going to go for it. And so the last five years have been, I want to say making decisions to get closer to that, but it's more like um, opening, uh, opportunities were just coming. Mm -hmm. And I think it was because I was painting it and becoming that conduit, my life started to open up a little bit with opportunities. I didn't see where they were leading me. I ran an artist residency program. I worked for a gallery, learned the gallery system. I got to meet international artists through the residency program, started to understand, first of all, how hard they work. Like, I was really impressed. Which by residency hard... program did you do? So, no, I ran this program up in St. Helena, up in Napa. Oh, you got it. So for, for this gallery in uh, Menlo Park. And so okay. I, she would fly in artists from around the world and we would play bocce ball on a vineyard and paint, <laughs> but I didn't get to paint as much because I was running this thing, but I got to watch these artists and their dedication and also saw kind of the ones that things weren't working for them business-wise and the ones that were thriving and starting to see some patterns. And so uh, that served me, I think, today. Oh, for sure, you connected the dots. Yeah. And then, so the next one was, I realized I wasn't painting that much. I was a little unhappy with my situation. A friend in LA says, why don't you come to LA? I got a place for you to stay. I have a studio you can use and just paint for six months. So I'm like, I'm in. So I quit the job. I go down, I'm just <laughs> painting every day. The pandemic hits, I end oh. up staying there for a year maybe over a year, just painting every wow. day, every day. What and a gift. That, and so that was only like two years ago, or not even that, a year ago. Well, almost two years, yeah. Yeah, and so then all this stuff started to happen. Another artist friend introduced me to some connections that got my work noticed. And then I don't know if you're familiar with the whole thing that happened with the De Young Museum here in the Bay Area. But you can tell us about it for so people the, that don't know. The De Young Museum during the pandemic, you know, no tourists were coming traveling and the museum didn't know what to do. So they decided to do an exhibition of all, Bay, an open call to all Bay Area artists to submit and they would do a huge Bay Area show in the De Young Museum. <laughs> you know, Amazing. The Young Museum. <laughs> and I got two paintings in. Yeah, it was, and there was a lot of people. I mean, it was, a, it was an interesting thing because so many good artists didn't get in and they were trying to deal with not getting in. So they were, it was a blind thing, so they didn't know who the, the judges were just looking at pieces. So some people that were like painting on their kitchen table got into the De Young Museum. <laughs> Amazing. But I got to tell you, a year before my mother has passed, and the, the last outing we did in her in a wheelchair, we were at the De Young Museum 
going back oh, to my childhood. Oh, she got to she got to see she got to see no, it. She never knew, but if I had said to her, guess what? In a year and a half, I'm going to be hanging in the De Young Museum. Oh, a year <laughs> before that. Okay, before. got it. Got it. Oh. That was our last oh. outing, which brings you back to her bringing me to the museums and what I a wish full you, circle. I love that. I wish that. I could have seen I wish she could have been there cuz it was, yeah. She was there. She was, was with you, yeah, totally. for sure. Oh my God, and smiling and probably toasting you from up there. Yeah, completely, yeah. Oh geez. my gosh, so when I'm listening to your story, I feel like when you're most vulnerable, it's when you're really opening your channels and let everything come into you and you are letting yourself flow through it. it out of desperation sometimes, yeah. That, it, that that's your only choice, it's like you're, <laughs> you get to a certain <laughs> point and it's just like you have no other choice but to just try to open to it all and then I've just had the experience of I've been pretty open about taking opportunities and moving and and all the stuff's just working right now and it's just so it's so fun to just witness it <laughs> like sit back so then from being in your studio to LA you made now, now you're in the ICD building, right? I got another opportunity from another artist who invited me up to, to come into temporarily come to a San Francisco studio. And so then I got to, you know, work there. And he was a really um, good with business and stuff. He got me on spreadsheets and really showed me some of how the business works. And so uh, then that opportunity was kind of temporary. So then suddenly here, an artist, Bibby, <laughs> invites me over to come visit her and basically talks me into <laughs> taking this huge studio. <laughs> and I'm just like, another thing, I'm just like, I can't do this. It's like too big. It's too much. And same thing, I just go, you know what? I've been taking these leaps of faith and they keep working. I might as well just keep going with it. And so here I've been here almost five months and it's all working. Like it's all working and, and more than I ever could have imagined even like it's pretty amazing. That's amazing. So, so tell us a little bit about all is working. What it means all is working. Uh, I'm painting. I get up every day. I have a studio to come to. I'm inspired. I'm doing the business side. You know, I'm selling artwork, right? That's what you need to do. <laughs> so artwork selling so I can afford this stuff. I, you know, I was a little scared at the beginning with, how much I was paying for the studio. So I did some workshops and I actually really liked it. And so, um, so I'm doing that as well. Um, so it's all these things together. And, and like I said, with those artists that I witnessed at the residency, it's a lot of work, but I it's love a it. Lot of like, work. <laughs> I'm happy to be driving to work, you know, and be here. And so, yeah, it's, and, you get and, the and there's there's definitely something to say about being surrounded with a community of artists that inspire you and you inspire them and your conversations on the hallways can be very inspiring. So yeah. all of that is it's energy. Yeah. And it's a big part of it, actually. You know, I think most artists were pretty isolated and we try to be as good a business people as we can, but it's hard, you know, making those connections and stuff. And the building I'm in is uh, called the ICB building in Sausalito. And there are about a hundred artists in this huge warehouse building. And uh, it's kind of a built-in uh, business plan because lots of people come through uh, that buy art and interior designers and, and you get to talk with other artists. And uh, yeah, it's really, uh, that's it's actually what was kind of missing. It's yeah. It sounds like a win-win for right now, for sure. For sure. Yeah, for sure. So, okay, Gordon, take us around um, and show us your beautiful new studio. Okay, let's go here. Do you see the little arrows? <laughs> yeah, flip it. Yep, please. There we go. Okay, so there's, you can't see it, but there's sailboats out there. <laughs> <laughs> and so I have a little deck and you there. And you have a little... Um, deck out yeah, there, we'll which is really here. nice. Wow, so beautiful. Oh my goodness, look and at that so, view. Which is nice to have my own little entrance there, and then yeah, got a little where I you know do the the computer business work over here, 
and then wow look at the space oh yeah, my goodness <laughs> that's a big space gordon it's a big space it. <laughs> and i really thought that i was going to divide it and stuff and now i'm i i'm thinking i need a little bigger space <laughs> You get used to it, right? You grow, you kind of grow into what. Right, exactly. But so now I'm working pretty big. So this is a commission piece I'm working on. Oh, let's go look at that. So what I do actually is I'll is do Is it a three... diptych or is it? They're 60 by 60. But, but is that commission a diptych or they're separate? No, what I do is I work multiple. So when I do a commission, I will do get three custom panels made. So there's the two, and there's the third, which I'm going to show a demo on that one a little bit. And so I'll work them as what do you call it, a triptych? Yeah. 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 So I'll work them like this. I worked it as a triptych for a while. Then I start to separate them, and they start to have their own individuals. So here's a another commission that's about to happen. And see, I've got three. You three work made. on uh, is it uh, wood? Yes. Yeah, they're wood, wood panels, panels, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we have someone in the building that's great, that makes these great panels. Oh, so I'll amazing. be doing the same thing. I'll paint all three a triptych, and then I'll start to, to pull the panels off. And I actually, in my workshops, I do something similar where I have people work on multiples, and then we pull out, like, the best ones from the multiples, and then we finish them off. So, so can, we, can, can you go um, in that corner that you just showed us? Um, can we go slowly? <laughs> on each one of them and you can tell us a little bit about um about what they are or what they mean to you and what you had if you thought of anything when you started or do you well, just go at it how do you start well this i think i used to just go at it like this was one of my first ones this just sold it uh and so this was one of my first big ones like quite a while ago well and uh but like, the, I used to just kind of really work more with like what the design of it was. Yeah. And now I'm not like that. Like now I'm more, I'm looking for accidents to happen more than I anything. I love that. Can you I'm go only... closer so we can see the mark making? So you use a lot of texture yeah, and you lots. use acrylics, right? I'm using acrylics. I sometimes finish with like oil stick or something, but mostly acrylic. I'll use house, house paint too. You know, your, 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 your earlier painting that you just showed me reminds me a little bit of Phil Augustine. Um, oh, yeah. Know, not, not that one, the next one up. Um, just the bold, the boldness of it and the industrial feel of it. And right. Um, you know, the big shapes and is he one of your, if, do you look up to him at all or? I, I definitely like, love his work. I don't know if I keep him in mind. I don't really keep other artists in mind as much. Um, this one actually though has been sitting around like this for a long time, me thinking mm. it's not finished. And then I just did something like just put these little details kind of in and then I decided it's finished. <laughs> so. Yeah, I actually love the details. <laughs> yeah, I thought I thought I was going to do something like start to paint some bigger shapes over it, but yeah, it's just a different kind of thing. But do you see this technique? Wow. And you were asking yes. about I post a lot yes. of things on my Instagram where I'm I'm putting masking fluid down. Off. Yeah, yeah. And so you have all that underpainting, then you paint that yellow over the the painting, but that's where you see it comes off this, I paint masking fluid. Then you remove it oh, and then the... what's underneath. And that's what I'm gonna try oh, to I show love you. That. I'm gonna try to show you that, but uh, my paint- it, is... it looks rusty. That one looks like, like almost like, a, you know, like rusty. Right. I love that. And that's only paint. Yeah, that's only paint. Like a lot of underpainting. Right. And then, and then I kind of finish it off with like the bolder shapes, but I have to have that underpainting because you know how it is. You'll, you'll make some great mark and then you realize it's too soon to make a good mark because you're, you don't have enough right. up underneath. I love, I love the boldness of it. You know, I, I, there's something to say about, you know, sometimes we're scared of, you know, making big shapes and, and right. but here's, here's 
someone who's doing the big shapes and, and standing by them and, and it's very successful. I always feel like, uh, like you shouldn't know if that's a 12 inch by 12 inch or a six foot by six foot and vice versa. Like they I should agree. have the same kind of scale feel to them. I always think right. that's a good they sign. balance. Yes, yes. The balance right. seems to be the, you know, I, I totally agree with that statement. So, um, okay, keep showing us your studio. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff out right now, but I just, you know, got some storage and things. Things get put away and then some, sometimes you realize they come out again and have a second life. Oh, here's the second piece I'm going to donate. So, but first, let's talk about the first piece that oh, um, you donated. <laughs> Maybe I can hang and, Yes, that's okay. You can just show it to us. Um, or hang them. Well, it's just, I got a... You got a nail? <laughs> okay. So here's the piece that Gordon um, donated for Feeding America. And last night, um, we had an amazing collector and she bought this and we made, you know, we, we contributed with 5,000 meals um, for people in need. So I'm super happy. That's so and great. I know I'm so excited, Gordon. Thank you so much. And then you were so gracious because now you decided to donate a second one. piece. And so if anyone is interested in purchasing his second piece, it's still available since I just posted this morning. And um, again, I still need you can to get, the frame, you can get um, this incredible piece by Gordon and uh, it's a 10 by 10, it's framed. And please DM me or Gordon for instructions on how you can help people in need and get in turn a beautiful piece of artwork. So thank you, Gordon, this is thank amazing. You. Thank you so, so, so much. And thank it's you a, again. That's so amazing what, what $500 can do too. It's, it's incredible. Truly, it's, it's unbelievable. And um, we couldn't do it without the collector. So thank you so, so much. What is that? Well, I have another side of me where I do figurative stuff. Oh, but my that's God. More of a I don't little think I've secret. ever seen that. <laughs> it's more of a little secret. Wow. And I'm thinking about doing sort of meshing the, the abstraction and doing some big sort of abstract figurative pieces please do oh my goodness if i can get I through think, all these commissions yes, you, I will. yes 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 all right so you're gonna give us a little demo you want me to show you this on, yeah so walk us through and maybe even show us the materials that you use so okay. we know exactly what is happening okay it's kind of hard to follow i know it let me turn the lights on real quick So the, the theory behind it is that, well, it's kind of dark, but. Um, That's okay. We can still see it. Is that there's all this underpainting under that. And okay. so uh, I use this masking solution. Okay. There we go. And I actually, uh, I've settled on this this stuff, which is green, which helps you pick up where it is under there. So oh. on the underpainting, I lay in shapes, paint them on with this stuff, let that dry. Then I paint these large areas of color. Let them with, dry. Now, with what, with dry. what paint? With what? Is it acrylic on top yeah, of it? Acrylic, this is all acrylic. OK. And under here are going to be where the masking fluid is. You OK. It's hard to see from here the green, but I'm sure when you start scraping, we'll see it. Okay, I'm going to start scraping. How did you find that product? Is it from a painting store or is it a, uh, hard, from an art hardware, store? Hardware. Hardware. Store. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so let's say that you have an acrylic piece of, of painting and then you grab that masking and then you make your big shapes with it, let it dry, and then you apply it 
second coat of acrylic and now you're going to start scraping off. And then correct? let it dry. The only let issue is some of that brown down there actually didn't dry. So oh. last night. So, so here we go. So now I tried to find that. Here it is. Oh, wow. <laughs> It's just like a, almost like a rubber. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's interesting how the acrylic is behaving. It's like, like a, yeah. Like a sheet of elastic plastic. It's hard to find where you have it. With the green, does that help you or not really? What's that? With the green, does that help you? Does that, yeah, that come that through? Yeah, that helps a lot. Because the other stuff was dry and clear, so it was hard to. Oops. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think. Yeah. Um. There. There. Perfect. Wow. How, how, Gordon, how does the surrounding paint that you have underneath doesn't scrape off? It, just, it seems to hold. It's crazy. But I do have to say that it needs to dry a little longer. That's okay. But if you can take the, the phone closer so we can see, just you don't have to scrape anymore, so we can just see what you're doing up close. Oh, wow. So okay, see, now so you've got, and sometimes you forget what you had under there. So it's like this awesome kind of accident. Wow. Have you had any problems um, after you're done? Do you varnish it? Does it stay? Does it, do, do you have any control of what will happen in a few years? Yeah. No, it just, it holds and then I varnish it. So it, it sort of put, brings it all together. Wow. So see, That's look at that, I mean, it's just <laughs> that great, yeah, I all that, that stuff you had underneath that was really just kind of like a, you weren't really paying attention to what you were putting under there. Uh, Suddenly becomes. What happens if you don't remove all the peel? Then you have a problem. Then you have yeah, a problem. then you'd have a problem. But, you know, like tomorrow I might find little. You actually just, you have to really thoroughly scrape like right on the edge to make sure you got it all. Like that. But then, it's, then you're fine. It's all paint. Okay, so you've got to make sure that, that it all comes out. See, look, when I take that off, now suddenly that's a really strong, it's holding there. Look at that. See, it's not coming I can't, off. We can't see it. We can't see that part. Oh, there we go. Oh, wow. Okay, hello. So, I mean, I, you just keep going over it and it will hold. Look, it's not coming off. Um, we have another question. How do you apply the peel tech? Do you use any special brushes or anything like that? No, just a regular brush, whatever size you want it to be. Now you can, okay. you can, you can also put it on kind of lightly and then you get a different kind of scratching look. So it's not super thick. Got it. So, so it, it just depends on the thickness of it? Yeah, like if you just did a very like loose brush stroke, it'll stick kind of, it'll go wherever that brush mark went. So it can be lighter and then you get more of a, a scrapey feel, but this is what I did for wow. that. So that's the same technique. Wow, and then so, I'll, you, also, so the little stringies that you have there, it's probably with a smaller brush? Yes, and see I did that there too, look. Oh yeah, Those lines. I love that. 
And that straight, that straight one, I just did tape. Oh. That was just tape. Blue tape? Yes. Wow. And it held pretty well. It held pretty well. I think I did, uh, maybe I can show you. I did one that was kind of looser. So this is what I'm talking about. See, I didn't really make hard, hard, hard edges. Yeah. So it gave it a more organic -y kind of feel. So if someone has never tried this, <laughs> um, what do you suggest? How do you, how do they start with this idea? Smaller well, I think, on a smaller, like 12 by 12 panel? Yeah, totally. Yeah, and a little small one. You want to think about making that, uh, this under, this background. Don't worry about your composition at all, but do it, do worry about like varying textures and, uh, and, and some contrast a little bit. But it's, it's really fun because there's no pressure. And then you have the element of surprise because you're surprising yourself too. As I was scraping that, I'm like, I totally had forgot. And then look, those little <laughs> dot things are totally cool. And yeah, those things are cool. And I had I, no I idea. I think that that, you know, that the element of surprising yourself um, is, is a really cool thing. And I, I actually found that when I was doing my, my paper prints, you know, my right. it, using a gel, uh, uh, plate, you know, you just don't know what you're going to get. And that feeling, it's a very exciting feeling. And what else is kind of a nice, it's the contrast between, see, contrast is everything in art. <laughs> <laughs> On all levels, color, composition, but it's the contrast of thinking you having control and then not having control. That yeah. tension between, so I actually painted those shapes, but yet there's all these accidents happening and it's, I don't know in what manner it's going to scrape off. So it's that combination of control, but it's not control. God, I can't wait to see it all scraped off. <laughs> well, this was just like, I did it for the demo thinking, I didn't even care about what I was doing. And now I'm thinking, I like it. <laughs> I do too. I mean, it's, there are actually it's... shapes all up in that big area there and all down there. I'll do an update on my Instagram if people want to see where this ends up. Oh, for After sure. I scrape it all off. So can you show us the material that you have on your table? Oh, over here? Yeah. Oh, what is your, your um, do you like one paint over another or do you use anything that you can find? I use a lot of house paint, but when it gets to be uh, near the end and I'm doing some maybe really important marks that the paint needs to be good paint, I actually use Nova paint in LA. Yeah. So it's really like silky and it has a, the viscosity is great. And so I found that, you know, I, I, when I do my workshops, I, I was trying to, I got a bunch of paint the first time that was kind of cheap and I realized it's just not worth it. Cause it uh, just, yeah. the color like fades off. Yeah. So, but you know what, what's great about the beginning marks it doesn't matter what you do. But as you get to start to refine, then pull out your good stuff <laughs> and start to do that kind of thing. But I find I'm at the hardware store more than the art store. Yeah, that's what I Just thought. getting like, you know, sc paint scrapers and, you know. Yeah, and I think because you're on wood panel, you're not, you know, you're not afraid. Right. If you, you can were really on canvas. That, that, that's the other thing. If people want to try this, you you want to do it on wood panel. Like, don't try it on canvas. Right. For sure. It, you'll rip your canvas up. Yeah. So um, I know you're going to be ready to do a workshop. And you always talk about, you know, working in multiples. And I love what you showed me um, uh, the other day when you and I talked. Um, because you let your people know that they don't have to have control on the right. contrary just go for it and yeah. then you'll start making the composition with let's say nine pieces of 10 by 10s so i give them all no i give them nine 10 by 10 i have them just first of all just put a color on it 
And, and like I was saying, maybe little marks and stuff like little splatters and scratches and stuff. So there's, it's a great way to start a workshop because there's no pressure. We're just making splatters and marks and scrapes and stuff. And then when we have that background, we put them all together, nine 10 by 10s to make a 30, is that right? 30, 30 by, by 30. 30, yeah. It's, that seems like the right number because the middle one never works and you need, that combo seems to really work. To Then we paint one big one. Now people start getting more judgmental and trying harder to control because they're trying to make a 30 by 30 good painting. And they get frustrated, but what we, or they don't, or they're, cause there's a lot of great artists. And, but then what we, we, we find that we can look and pull them out. It's like the thing when you have a painting and you post something on Instagram and you zoom in on one part, it looks like a masterpiece. Right, exactly. You wish you could just get a saw and chop that exactly. out, right? It's the same theory. So then it, I tell you what, it happens every single time. It doesn't matter if it's a beginner, or someone that's super experienced, we can find two pieces by accident. We pull them out and they're awesome. But the only trick is you have to know which two it is. So we talk about trying to develop an editor's eye to know which ones are really working. And in the class though, we also have feedback because inevitably everyone will love to the same ones. So they get some feedback about we all decide which one is working, which one's not. But they made it, you know? Now it was so, kind of an accident, but they made it. How did you get the courage to say, I have the goods to now be teaching? What made you say, okay, I'm, I'm ready to do this? Well, not till after I'd done it. <laughs> 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 I, I wasn't sure. And I really, I tried to develop a, like a curriculum and I needed, I needed to develop some like principles and formulas, like I needed and they had enough handouts. And I was just like, you know what? I'm just gonna do one. I'm gonna do this little thing that I do because this is what I do. I work in multiples and then identify which ones work. I go, I'll just do that and see how it goes. And you know, when it was done, it seemed like we all had fun and stuff, but then people are getting all this feedback. People are saying, God, that was really freed me up and I, I feel more confident and they started to really stretch their work more. And so it, then that feedback made me think, okay, maybe I can do this. So maybe I will have handouts eventually or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you what, you know, I think anyone that's taught will probably say the same thing, which is it's such a therapeutic thing for my own practice, like because like the other day, I was completely frustrated with something. Actually, the one with the, with the yellow in it. Yeah. Like I needed to do something. And I heard my voice saying to the people in the workshop, it doesn't matter. Just do something. You know, because do something that is going to make a mistake or do something. That, and, and so I had to kind of live my own words and do that. And it, it, I like how it turned out. But I had to sort of get in that mindset that, you know, it's, but we do teach because, you know, nothing is precious, but there is a point where you have decided this painting is working almost as it is, but then you want to try to maybe balance it just a little bit, like, and that's the, that's where maybe there are some principles about how to just move the eye around just a little bit to balance it slightly, but that's only like 10% of the whole thing. When the you were doing illustration, did you have all these thoughts about composition and balance and, you know, and shapes and, and saturation? And did you, did you think of this or did you just work freely? I think at the beginning you had to control things because it was so primitive, but as Photoshop got more developed and stuff, it was about, you could try a million things because you can put a layer on, take it off, you can undo. So you started to learn about how Things you would never expect work. And then also learning about borders. Because I'm always, you know, for an illustration, you're always working within a size. And this tendency to want to just put everything in there is a mistake. You've got to think.
bigger. Out of the box. So <laughs> you could do that and illustrate it. You could just, you know, you could blow stuff up. And, and, and I think that's an important principle with, with painting. And that's why the multiple thing works. Because you're not just pretending, pretending to paint outside the line. You actually are painting outside the line. But then when you pull that piece out, that energy of the stroke that still is continued lives in that piece. But you're really yeah. doing it. You're not just pretending like, oh, I'm pretending like I'm making a big stroke. You actually are. And so- Do you, do you think now as a painter or as an illustrator or both? Painter, 100%. Yeah, I actually find it, I still, I have a rep in New York. I'm still doing illustration. And I find it more difficult, but I also find that I'm doing some better illustrations because I'm thinking more like a painter now. Interesting. But I feel like illustration, I feel the limitations of illustration, whereas I don't feel any limitation in painting. So that's kind of the difference. Um, and these are personal. The other thing is like, you know, people really want to know what your artwork means. And they kept asking me that question. I had no idea how to answer that. <laughs> and uh, there must be a reason why I'm making these shapes and stuff. And so I started to really think about it and look <clears> at my work more closely, like pull up a bottle of wine and stare at it for like an hour and starting to realize how emotional it is to me. Like these are emotional stories. These are about my childhood. These are about my dreams. I have a very vivid dream life. So, and they're very emotional. So these shapes of colors, are like big pieces of emotion and things and, and experiences and history and all the layering has to do with history and then also the moment of where you are in that moment versus the history. Anyhow, it's a, so there's this time relativity thing that. I, I love what you just said and my good friend Katie Cohen just um, she just said love your enthusiasm and honesty and oh, that's couldn't, great. Agree, couldn't agree more um, I'm actually opening um, now the comments for um, questions so if you have questions this is the right time to ask um, I see one um, do you ever mask over an area that you already masked like after oh gosh, adding that, other layers that's such a great idea <laughs> yeah, I'm going to do that tomorrow. <laughs> That's awesome. No, so I you've never I done it. I've never done the double mask, but that sounds, yeah, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, that could be a good one, right? That's a really good one. And our good friend Renda is here. She says, love you, Gordon. Oh, she's great. <laughs> they use what my the, studio. What is the, the, the masking called? Somebody's asking. There's a lot of different brands, so you might just find what you like, but this is the green stuff. Peel. So it's called Peel Tech. 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 Peel Tech. You see, it's like this green, rubbery. The other yeah. stuff's less rubbery. There's a okay. clear one. Um, okay. And they're asking, when is your next workshop? Uh, well, I have two that are all filled up that are coming up uh, end of January and February, but I do them like... Uh, every third month. And then there also, I have some plans for perhaps a, a summer workshop with another artist where we'll do a destination. There will be like a, a four to five day, maybe up in Napa or something. So that's kind of in the works as well. Okay. Before you put it out, you call me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 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 you so, want that nice room, right? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I Next want to the sauna. That's what I want. I want in. But um, one of the things we're talking about. Do you do any virtual work workshops at all? Um, I, I, I've thought about it. You know, it's a lot of work to try to put something like that together, but I definitely would love to do something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is your favorite varnish? I've, I used to use self-leveling gel and then do the museum wax and all that, but boy, it can be problematic. So now I've just settled on sort of a, a I 
I set it on instead of the self leveling. This seems to work a little better. The Liquitex pouring medium. It's a little easier to work with. And if that's you like varnish? that. Interesting. No, then I use just like what painters use on furniture. Oh, oh on, wow. So it, okay. it actually, it, it looks a lot like, it, so it's a urethane and it, it has kind of almost simulates that museum wax look and a caustic look a little bit. Right. So it has a little sh shine to it, but it's more of a satin. And this yeah. is just a hardware product. Wow, I love that. That's awesome. And dries quick too. It's and great. dries quick. And it's not and toxic? You, uh, easy to <laughs> clean up with water. So not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my and the more, now... and the more coats you, as you add more coats, it gets shinier and shinier so you can control. If you just do one coat, it's just kind of a, a satin. If you want to be a little more glossy, you just keep adding coats. Yeah, yeah. And then you can also work over it if you decide you want to do more work. Yeah, exactly. So, so my good friends now <laughs> said to come to New Orleans, and I would join you there because all of my good friends are there. <laughs> Yeah, so, I guess I have friends there now too. So yes, you do. <laughs> um, how did you discover the masking idea? Um, it had to do with I was creating those shapes before with uh, painting around, and it was just getting the control you have. Like I would paint the negative space, and so I just I don't know. I, I when I was younger, I did some airbrush stuff, and so you'd use mm -hmm. masking and airbrush. And to tell you the truth. I just got a big industrial airbrusher and I'm thinking about putting this masking solution in the airbrush and spraying it to see what kind of effects I can get. Like I can put it, you can put a stencil and then spray it, the, the rubber stuff. So you, oh. could, you could do something like that. I don't know, I haven't tried it yet. Oh, does it come in a spray? No, but I bought a, Oh, I don't know where I put it, but I oh, bought a big okay. industrial, like uh, what painters use. Yeah. Because, because with the other- The sprayer. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. Stuff, I, like uh, a hose, you got a hose. I can't find it. But on the other masking stuff, they had a little photograph of a guy using an airbrush to apply it. Because it, yeah. this is what painters do, they like, they, they tape it off and then they paint like around the windows and stuff. Right, right. So um, I thought, I, why couldn't I do that? I could put it in the airbrush thing. That would be so much easier for you. Way yeah. easier for you. Way easier. Um, how does the varnish react with the oil paint on top of the acrylic? Uh, that work. It's okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then someone is asking if you have any of your illustrations somewhere that you can show us a couple. Uh. Uh, they're they're all digital, but if you go to m my full name Gordon Studer Illo. dot com, that all my commercial stuff's there. Perfect. Um, yep. Someone said the oil based sealer turns yellow over time. That's why this one is uh, water based. Um, so that's really good. Um, Julie. Oh, Julie. oh, look! I see people I know. Doing yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Okay, let me just, he's using, he's using urethane over acrylic and oil, so it's, isn't an oil-based sealer? I don't know. I, I, I'm it? not the authority on, I'm not the authority on technical stuff, I'll tell you that, because actually, how I first tried this was, to get ready for this, I used an oil stick, like I used the uh, masking fluid. So I painted uh -huh. a shape, then I painted over it with acrylic and it bubbled up and oh. then I scraped it. So I'm not sure how stable that piece, but that was the one that went into the De Young too. And it was oh, still gosh. wet. It was still wet. Cause <laughs> oh my God. Did that you oil call stick, every day and say, is it okay? Is my painting changed? <laughs> well, they had it. Then someone, uh, Someone had it in a showroom and I would call as often because it was right above his desk. And I say, are there little chips falling onto your desk? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. But I, you know, I, I, 
you know what? I, I know we should create stable art, but um, I, I think you need to like forget rules sometimes because that's when accidents do happen. There was crazy stuff that you're not supposed to do. And I think right. that, that right. I'm pretty naive about some of this stuff. I'm learning as I go along. But some of those crazy things have become my, my trademark. And that first experiment with the oil stick that no one would say that, what are you doing? That's the craziest thing I ever heard of, led to this masking idea, which is more stable. Right. So, but I just think that you should try stuff. And, you know, thinking of archival and thinking of all that, you take a picture, you get a picture. <laughs> right, you get a picture. I'll be and dead. then you do an NFT on that. And then, right. you're, I'll... then you're done. Then you're good they go, to go, where is this guy? Oh, he died about <laughs> 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah, Jeffrey just said, rules are meant to be broken. Yes, they are. Exactly. So exactly. it's true creativity. And, um, and, and that's why we're here. Because it's uh, all about tapping into your creativity. And, and um, Gordon, you've been such a pleasure. And you've been so incredibly open about your process and inspirations and, and teaching us all how you do it and how you go about it. And it's just absolutely inspiring. Um, you gave us so much food for our souls. And I am so, so incredibly excited that you were here today with us. And if you have any questions um, for Gordon, I'm sure that you can just DM him and he will be no happy problem. to yeah. answer any questions. I'd be and happy to, yeah. Um, again, um, can we just show the second piece real quick? Um, and um, <laughs> thank you everyone for being here. Seriously, I can't thank you enough. Your support means the world to me and to all my artists. I'm going to just quickly turn off the comments so we can see this beautiful piece of artwork um, that um, Gordon decided to, to donate this um, second piece of artwork. Um, if you love Gordon as much as I do, please consider making this donation. Um, remember, you're helping so many people in need of food now more than ever. I keep repeating that because it's so true. We are so fortunate that we have food on our tables, but not a lot of people do. So let's do good. Let's have a win-win today. And uh, we already did with having Gordon here. So thank you so thank you. much, Gordon. Thank you. Take care and have a great day. You too. Bye, everyone. Thanks again. Bye.